for now, I'd like to um, uh, hand over to uh, the Martin D'Agostino, um, who's going to uh, focus on foodborne viruses in uh, in particular. So, Martin, over to you. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, so, yes, my name is Martin D'Agostino. I'm food virologist here at, uh, at Camden BRI. So, I'm just going to be discussing uh, briefly on the current challenges and developments within uh, the area of foodborne viruses. Well, firstly, what we, I suppose we should do is establish what are foodborne viruses in the first place. Well, they are very different to foodborne bacteria. For a start, they are submicroscopic, so you cannot see them unless you use an electron microscope. They're about a tenth to a hundredth the size of bacteria. They are known as obligate intracellular par parasites, which means that they're not able to survive or replicate outside of their host, and so they have no internal metabolism to be able to do so. And unlike bacteria, they are unable to multiply on or in foodstuffs, but rather they can be carried by foods right into your gut. So really, once they are ingested, they infect us by targeting their specific host cell, and then their genomic material is then transferred to the host cell, which the viruses use to replicate themselves. And once they've really exhausted the cell supplies, a large number of these replicated viruses burst out of the cell and then go on to infect other cells. And then that initiates a response from the body in the form of the symptoms of the infection. So that's what happens with the, with the viruses, which are quite different to bacteria. So the main viruses of concern with regard to foodborne illness are human norovirus, hepatitis A virus, and hepatitis E virus. And I'm just going to um, briefly uh, mention a few things about each one of these. So in terms of norovirus, it is by far the most common cause of gastrointestinal illness worldwide. Although there are other species-specific norovirus, such as mouse norovirus, the foodborne strain, which we are talking about here, is really specific to humans. It doesn't affect any other species. So if you get infected by norovirus, its origin is the human gut. A lot of norovirus illness is caused by human-to-human -human contact, but there is an increasing percentage due to foodborne contamination. And it has one of the largest economic impacts of all illnesses, costing the UK over £100 million a year to treat um, and in loss of productivity. And the, world, the worldwide figures are really quite staggering, um, with about 685 million cases annually, 200 million in children under five, and that leads to about 50,000 child deaths each year, almost in all in developing countries. Of course, not, um, that's not related to all foodborne illness, but um, a lot of that is person to person as well. But that costs worldwide around about $60 billion in healthcare and loss of productivity, which is quite incredible. Uh, and just with regards to outbreaks, um, the, one of the, the latest outbreaks, um, in certainly in the UK anyway, has been associated with the Oaxaca Mexican restaurant chain, where over 300 diners and staff became infected with norovirus. Uh, now, as, as yet, the source hasn't been revealed, um, but they have actually claimed liability, and they've started to do payouts to those who have become seriously ill. Uh, and usually, a serious illness only occurs where there where there's been an underlying illness already in um, someone who's been infected. So that has happened in a couple of cases within um, this outbreak, apparently. So um, as far as I'm aware, the, the Public Health England um, will be producing a report on this in due course. So it should be interesting to see all the details for this. Not so common as norovirus is hepatitis A virus, which is also a human-specific virus. Again, this is spread by the fecal oral route, and as with uh, a lot of other um, diseases, it can be uh, transferred by dirty contaminated water, but as far as um, foodstuffs is concerned, the main association um, with hepatitis C with foodborne illness tends to be from frozen produce, um, and a lot of it to do with frozen berries from, um, that have been sourced from outside of the UK. A couple of uh, fairly recent outbreaks uh, associated with hepatitis A um, are listed on this slide. Uh, one in Virginia, um, in the USA, it started in Virginia back in 2016, um, which were associated with imported Egyptian strawberries. 
which were contaminated with hepatitis A, and these were used to produce tropical smoothies. And they were um, consumed in various smoothie cafes throughout uh, the uh, uh, various states in the US. And that resulted in 132 getting sick, with 52 hospitalizations across eight states in the US. And very recently in Scotland, um, just this year, in the spring, there was 61 confirmed cases of uh, associated with hepatitis A, all linked with uh, products being consumed from a bakery. Uh, at the moment, we again, uh, um, we don't know the, the source of that, but all the staff have tested negative. So again, that will be interesting to see the report when that finally comes out for that one. But that just shows that, uh, you know, although it's not as common as, as norovirus, in terms of outbreaks, they do tend to be uh, involve quite a lot of people. Now, hepatitis E virus is the only one here which has a different route of transmission. It's a zoonotic virus, which means it originates in an animal reservoir. In this case, the most common reservoir is pigs but it has been implicated in outbreaks associated with deer, wild boar, and possibly now rabbit meat, although this hasn't been confirmed. But they did find five out of 919 French hepatitis E cases um, were rabbit associated. It is now known that the pig population in the UK and in other European countries is infected endemically with hepatitis E. The pigs, however, don't show any symptoms of the disease, so you can't tell. Um, um, but uh, if the pigs got it or not, but it only manifests itself when humans become infected. It's the virus we're the least known about it due to its relative recent appearance as a foodborne virus and the inability to perform culture-based studies. It has become of increasing concern to the pork meat industry due to large numbers of people who have not been traveling having found to be infected with a strain of hepatitis E, which is not circulating in the UK, but which has been found in pork products in Europe. The main concern is linked to the consumption of raw or undercooked pork products and the lack of data to confirm its heat resistance profile. Other European countries have found similarly high numbers of people who have been infected but who have not travelled. So what are the main foods at risk from these viruses? Well, this is uh, outlined on this slide. As you can see, it's mainly foods which are eaten raw or minimally processed, such as shellfish, raw salad vegetables and soft fruits. The main causes of contamination uh, are due to sewage contaminated irrigation water, could be uh, contaminated handless hands. Uh, also, in the case of hepatitis E, it's the contaminated pork itself, so it can be uh, got from the, the blood um, for, that's in uh, pork livers and various other muscle tissue um, in the pork products. So if these are eaten raw or as I say, minimally, minimally processed, uh, there is a chance that um, you could get infected with, with any of these viruses. So really, um, of course, as the case for pork is concerned, cooking thoroughly is, is going to be able to, to eliminate the, the risk. But again, there's, there's very little data on the actual heat profile for uh, hepatitis C. That's just something to bear in mind. So there are several challenges uh, with regard to foodborne viruses. I'm just going to deal with these. The first is really preventing contamination at source. So this involves really being aware of the issues regarding unclean irrigation water sources, the, the need for really good sanitary conditions on farms, such as, you know, is, is, there, is there decent uh, toilet facilities? Are there hand washing stations where the people can wash uh, hands before touching the produce? And in the case of hepatitis E, um, again, making sure that uh, all things that are touched with uh, the carcasses or, or blood products are kept away from final product. The second challenge is with regard to detection of viruses in a laboratory setting. We know that contamination occurs, but how can we detect this contamination? Currently, we cannot grow viruses in the lab like we can bacteria, so we have to directly detect them from the foods they are on. And since we are dealing with such small organisms, this can be difficult to do. But there are now methods available which can detect the presence of viruses on foods. And this is a recent uh, development in the ISO methodology, which has now been published as a full ISO method. The third challenge is the application of appropriate control, measure, uh, control measures. So really, if initial preventative measures are unsuccessful, 
how can we actually treat the foods without affecting their delicate organoleptic qualities? So freezing will not affect viruses, it will rather preserve them. And washing them might help, but it might not eliminate the risk. So novel procedures such as UV and cold plasma treatments are being looked into. The main control measure, though, is the application of good agricultural practice, good hygienic practice, and regular certification of food safety management systems. There have been two or three European-based uh, projects which have looked into these issues and found that the main uh, appropriate primary control measure is to put these practices into force and make sure that they are monitored correctly. However, as we know, sometimes these things don't work as they should, and that this is why we, we do have see problems coming up through the, the uh, other parts of the food supply chain uh, with regard to outbreaks occurring and problems later on down the line. And finally, the fourth main challenge is the development of cult cultural methods. So as I stated previously, we can't grow these viruses like we can bacteria in the lab at the moment. So our main focus in the area of food virology is the development of appropriate cell culture systems, which will allow infectivity studies to be performed. The UK Food Standards Agency has this as a main priority for a hepatitis E virus, whilst in the US, development of a neurovirus cell culture system is underway. Clinical hepatitis A virus cell culture does exist, but it's not yet adapted for use with food studies. So we're a little bit of time away really from being able to culture these viruses in the laboratory as well as we can bacteria. But once we are able to do this, we'll be able to tell a lot more about the actual uh, profile of these organisms. So how can we help um, at Camden BRI? Well, we want to be able to help you with advice and information with regard to foodborne virus concerns. We now have a testing service available for the detection of neurovirus and hepatitis A virus in fresh and frozen produce. At our member interest groups, the latest news on foodborne viruses is presented regularly. And in November, we will have a hepatitis E specific seminar, which will discuss the latest issues related to the pork meat industry. And that's on November the 28th. We can also perform surrogate virus studies, which can stimulate various control measures such as pH and water activity on the effects of viruses. So if you do have any issues, please feel free to get in contact if you have any issues regarding foodborne viruses, any questions, or if you need any advice or testing, and we'll see if we can help you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Martin. That was another uh, brilliant overview of, um, of uh, what's going on in uh, microbiology uh, and um, the issues surrounding uh, foodborne viruses. Uh, we've got some questions. First of all, uh, we've been asked, how long can viruses be supported on foods? Um, that's a good question, yes. Um, again, this uh, will uh, vary depending on which uh, food type it is and also the level of contamination uh, on the food. But in general, the foods that we're talking about here, especially fresh products, uh, they're not... Um, on the shelves for a long, a long period of time in general, like strawberries, lettuces, uh, raspberries, etc. So they will um, usually be consumed within a, a couple of weeks of being uh, produced um, or har harvested. And you know there are um, obviously um, outbreaks which have occurred uh, um, due to the consumption of fresh produce. So they will, they will. Um, certainly be able to last uh, for at least a few days on, on these surfaces, as long as they're not um, uh, exposed to things such as UV. So, um, but in terms of uh, other types of foods, um, as I mentioned there, uh, um, frozen foods such as frozen berries, uh, frozen strawberries, like these ones which have been imported all the way from China perhaps or from, from Egypt, uh, they have shown um, to be the cause of outbreaks, uh, multi-state outbreaks as well. So, um, yeah, they can they can be preserved for weeks or potentially months on the surfaces of these um, products. Uh, so, it just it really depends on the storage or how quickly they are they're consumed if they're fresh. Okay, excellent. And uh, the next question is is also about strawberries. Um, 
the question is, uh, does uh, washing uh, remove viruses with or without chemicals and uh, soft fruits, including strawberry as well, as given as the example. So are we able to comment on that? Um, yes, uh, again, I, I, hate saying, I hate saying the phrase, it depends. But it does, it does depend on the, on the level of contamination and, and the nature of what uh, the, uh, the camp contaminate, contaminant is. Because mainly, if, if, it's, um, if it's norovirus or hepatitis A, for example, that is most likely to be found on uh, strawberries, uh, this is likely to be from irrigation water um, or contaminated handlers' hands. And if it's um, from contaminated handlers' hands, it's not a very nice subject to have to discuss, but this is directly, mainly going to be directly from fecal contact, which is going directly onto the strawberries. And when you think of strawberries as a matrix, so it's a very complex uh, surface when you look at it microscopically. There's lots of places for the viruses to hide away in the, in the crevices of where the seeds are. And, um, you know, so it, they can hide away a lot more easily than they can um, back, bacteria can. Uh, but in terms of washing, yes, it will help, but there's no guarantee that you're going to eliminate the risk. And at the moment, we don't know the, the sort of levels that we're talking about on the, the produce, so that we don't know the, the sort of common levels of viruses that will be on the produce, such as lettuce and strawberries. So we, we can't really tell how much of a reduction will take place when, when we're washing them. So, um, but also just to add to that is the fact that we know that they have very high electrostatic bonds, so they, so they bond very tightly to the surface of fruit. Uh, and they can be quite difficult to wash off. So it will certainly help, but it might not eliminate the risk. That's all I can say really about that. Okay, excellent. Um, I'm getting conscious of the time. Uh, we have far more questions than uh, we have time to answer in this session. So uh, you'll have uh, contact details for Martin. If you do have a burning question, then by all means send, uh, send that in at a later time. But I think we'll have to draw the session to a close now. So uh, all that remains to be said is uh, thank you very much for attending today. Uh, we hope to see you at some of our uh, future events seminars, perhaps even the member interest groups uh, or other, uh, other webinars that we organise. So thank you, thank you very much for attending. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and all the best. Thank you.